and welcome back once again to Innerstorm Games Presents. This is our fifth series, and I'm here with my daughter Piper and my other daughter no, I'm, Trinity. I'm, no, I'm Izzy. I'm sorry, we're, my daughter Izzy from, where are you from? Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Jake and the Neverland Pirates. And we're getting ready to start our fifth playthrough. This one's going to be, uh, or excuse me, our fourth, third, ah. third playthrough. Fifth series, third playthrough. It's going to be Robinson Crusoe and the Adventures on the Cursed Island. And we'll get that kicked off started here in just a bit. And we've lost Trin from the screen. Uh, but maybe she'll join us back later on. And we'll wait and see. And otherwise, we'll see you at the table. This is what the board looks like once it's all set up for Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. But this is a rules video and before we can learn the rules we have to know what the components are. So we'll go around the board one by one and take a look at each of these components. During the game players will take on the role of one of four characters. Those characters include the explorer, the soldier, the cook, or the carpenter. Let's take a look at one of the character cards now just to see what all is entailed on each card. As we look at the character card, we notice first off that the type of character is right up here at the top, whether it's explorer, soldier, cook, or captain, with a nice representation of the character. And if you're a lady playing the game, you can flip the card over and as you can see there's a representation of the opposite sex on the other side. The rest of the information is the same though. Uh, there are four skills. Each character has uh, what are called determination skills, where they can use determination tokens, and we'll talk about those later, uh, to activate those skills. Each character also has a life track, and they'll receive a, a small wooden, red wooden token to track the wounds they receive throughout the game. When a character's uh, life token reaches the skull and crossbones, that character is dead, players out of the game, and all the players lose, and the game wins. Each character also has a starting item. Uh, in this case, for the explorer, it's a shortcut. And so you would find that invention in the list, in the uh, invention card list. And we'll, again, we'll talk about those later. And then this, this is a, an invention that is unique to this explorer. Only this explorer can discover this invention, provided that they have the necessary prerequisites to do so. In this case, the prerequisite for the shortcut is the map. And again, we'll go into detail on that when we discuss the invention cards in just a little bit. The game also includes several tokens uh, in several colors. Uh, each character or each player will get two tokens of the same color to represent the actions that they can take in a given turn. Only two tokens are available per player per character. And what kind of Robinson Crusoe game would this be if you didn't have Friday? When Friday acts as an additional character available for all players, it comes with one token, and so he can participate either in actions on his own or in supporting actions if another player is already taking an action. And again, we'll discuss actions later on in this rules video. Similar to Friday, but not quite as powerful, is the dog. The dog can be used by players to do either exploration or hunting actions. As players explore the island, they'll be flipping over these hex tiles that indicate the different areas of the island. Uh, each tile will show what kind of terrain type it is, whether it's beach, mountain, or other type. It will indicate the resources available on this particular tile. It will indicate whether or not a beast card is added to the beast deck, whether or not a shelter is provided by this island, and whether or not any discovery tokens will be drawn. A key component of the game are the event cards, represented by this kind of green flaggish uh, background with a question mark. And what these represent are tasks and things that the players will need to accomplish in order to uh, avoid detrimental effects. However, if they complete the task on there, they actually get something good. So it is definitely uh, advantageous to complete these events. Adventure cards represent each of the three areas of actions, which are the exploration, building, or gathering resources, and can be drawn and resolved throughout the course of the game, depending on dice rolls, token placement, or sometimes they'll just be added to the event deck and drawn that way. In some cases, the card can be divided into uh, two segments, and so if so, for instance, this uh, 
expiration card, if you draw it as part of an expiration phase or an action, expiration action, you'll do this top part, which I actually say to shuffle it into the event deck, and then later on, when you draw it out of the event deck, represented by this symbol down here, you'll do this second part, which actually gives you a uh, threat. Adventure cards are drawn whenever you roll a question mark on the appropriate colored die. It's green for expiration, brown for building, uh, gray for, for gathering resources. Uh, there are also tokens that kind of correlate to these dice, and we'll look at those in just a bit. Similar to the adventure uh, dice, these adventure tokens will be placed on the decks, and if the action is taken, an adventure card, uh, if an action from that type, uh, expiration, building, or resource gathering is taken, the adventure card must also be drawn immediately and resolved. As players are completing their actions, they may find they need to roll dice in order to find out if they've really been successful. So the dice are divided into the three sets of three different colors. So you have <clears throat> green for exploration, brown for building, and gray for resource gathering. And so what happened is if you had to roll the dice, you would find out a V would be a success result, but a roll of the two circles with little plus signs in them would mean that you failed, but you will still get two determination tokens. The broken heart means you've taken a wound, with a blank as you have not. And the question mark means that you're going to draw an adventure card of that corresponding type, whether it's exploration or building or gathering resources. And again, the blank side means that you would not. All three dice must be rolled any time you need to roll them in order to complete an action. Inventions represent things that you can build or create throughout the course of the game. Uh, each invention is going to have its own prerequisite. So for instance, the furnace requires brick. Has to have been, uh, you have to have, have access to brick. Uh, whereas the bow would require uh, rope, a knife, and a wood resource. And then each one is going to provide a benefit after it's created. For instance, the furnace will help you uh, ignore one one result of, of snow, and the bow will add three to your um, track, on the hunting track. The players will also receive starting items, usually two, to start the game out. <clears throat> and this example, the Bible and the pistol. Uh, each one item can only be used twice throughout the game, and so you place back cubes on them and remove one each time the item is used. So after the second one is removed, the item can no longer be used for the rest of the game. Beast cards don't start the game in play, but will be added to a hunting deck throughout the course of the game, and they represent um, the animals that are on the island that we might encounter and have to defeat, or they might really hurt us. Mystery cards represent other items you might encounter on the island. Uh, they might be you might find treasure, such as a hatchet, or maybe a monster or a trap might be lying underneath. Three other dice used in the game will be the rain dice, the winter dice and the Hungry Animals dice. These dice are rolled at certain points of the game to test the weather effects, usually indicated by either event cards or adventure cards. For instance, the rain card might wash away the roof of your shelter, or the Hungry, the, uh, hungry Animal die, you might have to fight a beast or lose some palisade points or have some food rot. The winter dice will cause snow that again affects your shelter. Determination tokens can be gained and lost by players throughout the course of the game. They can be used to do various things. They can be used to, to activate player actions or character actions. They might need to be discarded in order to uh, resolve a threat action or a threat event, or they might be needed to uh, complete a scenario objective. Resources in the game are indicated by uh, colored wooden cubes, brown representing wood, yellow representing food, orange representing non-perishable food, and white representing fur. Food is obviously consumed by the players between each turn to keep their character alive, whereas wood and uh, fur are used to complete different inventions throughout the game. Discovery tokens are provided by certain tiles or other event cards throughout the game. Uh, discovery is exactly that. It's something you've discovered during the course of your adventure, and it might be something as, uh, like an a extra wood resource. The camp and shelter token indicates uh, where your home camp is, and it can represent either just your camp or whether or not you've actually built a shelter in that location. Some tokens in the game will just be providing additional effects or indicating additional effects that are being applied to a certain area of the board. For instance, uh, plus one wood may be uh, one extra wood 
resource may be required to complete that action. Or perhaps you gain plus one food, or you need uh, one extra uh, worker to accomplish the action. Other effects might be rerolling a success on the adventure die, or perhaps adding one to the strength of a beast when going hunting from the beast deck. We saw the weather dice earlier, and these tokens will help us remember exactly what effects have been put in play by those dice, whether rain or snow. And they'll go on the board uh, just to help us remember. Each game is going to be played over the course of a, a scenario, and they'll indicate exactly how long the game lasts, what the wind conditions are, what the loose conditions are. We're going to be going through the very first scenario, scenario one, Castaways. In which case we'll have 12 turns uh, with increasing difficulty to complete the game. We'll go over scenario one more in detail when we actually uh, start the gameplay uh, next time. But as you can see, look at the card. It includes various items as to what the symbols uh, will represent, how many rounds there are, uh, shelter, tycons, special inventions that can be built strictly for this scenario. Now that we've seen the components, let's take a walk around the board. In the top left corner, you can see the phases of the game listed out. There's actually six phases uh, to each turn or each round of Robinson Crusoe, and that includes the event phase, the morale phase, the production phase, the action phase, the weather phase, and the night phase. Right next to that, you can see the event cards listed. Those are the uh, initial event cards, uh, the initial event deck. And that, that can get added to throughout the course of the game. Next to the event deck is the morale track used during the morale phase. And the morale is going to fluctuate up and down throughout the game depending on uh, cards that are drawn, events that happen, uh, items that are built. And so if the morale uh, track is on the upper side, then we're going to gain determination tokens, which is always good. If we get all the way up to uh, the third level, we can actually get two determinations and heal a wound. However, every time that the, uh, for all the negatives on the downside, you have to discard determination tokens, and at any point during the game, if you're ever not able to discard determination tokens, you take a wound uh, for each token that you're unable to uh, discard. Below the event deck and the morale track is the island where we'll be placing the tiles to represent the island. Uh, this is all it's divided up into several hexes. We'll be drawing tiles from the hex, hex tiles from the uh, island pile and placing them down to represent the various locations on the island that we'll be able to encounter. Back at the top of the board, next to the morale track, is where we'll store the resources that we've, we've earned that round. Resources are not always immediately available. They'll be put into a, uh, the top field there, and then after on the next turn they'll move down to that next square and they'll become available for use. And only the resources in that uh, bottom square are the ones that you can use for uh, building shelters or creating items. Next to the, uh, again, at the top of the board, next to the resource reservoir, yeah, is where the shelters and the, the roof and the palisade are used during the, the uh, build phase. So if you want to build a shelter, you take the build action and you can build a shelter. Once it's built, it's there for the whole game, and that protects us from getting taking any wounds during the night phase of the game. Next to that is the roof. And you can build a roof to help protect from uh, other weather conditions such as rain and snow. Next to the shelter is the, at the far top corner, is the weapon track. And the weapon track will help determine how strong we are against fighting certain beasts. For the difference between a beast and our weapon track, we'll have to take a wound for each level of difference. So you want to try and keep that, uh, that track gone. It's just one wood to advance one level on that track. Below all that, uh, next to the island in the middle of the board, are where all the inventions are located. These are the, all the inventions that are uh, initially open to us to be built uh, throughout the course of the game. And of course those will change from game to game uh, for each, each scenario. Uh, but these are the ones that we drew randomly along with some starting ones. The starting, uh, starting inventions can be indicated by the two arrows that point towards the name. For instance, the knife it would be considered a starting, starting invention. At the bottom of the board, uh, starting in the lower left corner, are where the event cards are placed as are located. Uh, as you can see, there's an arrow that indicates that they move from side to side uh, before they're removed from the game. And so, 
that basically gives you two turns to try and deal with any potential threats coming out of those event cards. Next to that is where the beast deck will be stored. Again, at the beginning of the game, we don't have a beast deck, and it'll actually be located off the board, and we'll build it up as the game progresses. Next to that are event cards related to building, uh, gathering resources, or exploration. And those are the cards that, as we resolve them, uh, we'll either resolve them immediately or we'll add them into the event deck, depending on how the card, uh, what the card tells us to do. Next to that, the blue tent icons. That's arranging the camp. You can play here as an action and gain two determination tokens, as well as you can advance the morale counter up one level. Beneath arrange the camp is rest. And to take the rest action means you're just going to rest and heal a wound. In regards to the actions, with the exception of the threat actions represented by the event cards, any of the actions should be taken multiple times as long as you have enough pawns to be placed there. For example, if I wanted to heal multiple wounds, I could place multiple uh, pawns or workers on the rest action space. During the weather phase is where we roll the weather dice to see what conditions, if any, uh, we have to face. And if any effects are put into play, we place the tokens in that area of the board to remind us that either storm or snow or rain uh, effects are, are in play at that time. And then phase six is the night phase, is uh, the reminder field down there in the last uh, bottom right corner. And uh, the night phase is basically where we resolve all the, um, the round that we just did and prepare for the, the next round. We'll go over exactly what in, is entailed in the night round when we go through the rules here in just a bit. The best way to describe how the game plays is really just to run through the six phases of the game. So we'll start out with the event phase. To start the event phase, you simply draw the top card of the event deck. In this case, the card says Cataclysm. And this, as you can also see, the card is divided into two separate uh, sections. Uh, we'll zoom in later, but you can see there's a, the top has an icon that matches the event deck, so it's the event icon. Below that is the threat icon, which matches this icon down here. The first thing you do after you draw the card is you look and see if there's any question marks. Uh, here there's a brown question mark. It might be gray, it might be green, depending on the uh, the action uh, that's being called out. In this case it's brown. And so that would be the, the build action. And so the first thing we do is we take one of these brown question marks and place it onto the, uh, the build deck. Well, that's going to mean, as we discussed earlier, is next time somebody takes a build action, we're going to draw one of those build cards and resolve it. Either add it to the event deck or uh, resolve it exactly as it says uh, at the immediate time. For instance, what the Cataclysm card is telling us to do now is now that we've placed our, our brown question mark icon, as it says, to put all, the fu put all items, uh, that would be all items here that we've created, into the future resources uh, bin because they're not going to be available this round and they'll move down to the current available resources time next time to be available in the next action phase. Then what happened is we then slide this card over. We'd add this down to the threat level and if you can see uh, the threat is that uh, we need to use one action and then just uh, discard this card to get a um, determination token. So just one person played in that spot, we'll, we'll re resolve that and do away with it. And if we are not unable to accomplish that, then we have to discard one item card, or discard one item, and then cancel the effect if possible. Phase two is the a morale phase. And that's where we look at this track here, and we'll see there's a white marker that, depending on where it's at, will tell us whether we're going to lose determination tokens or gain determination tokens, and possibly gain tokens and heal ourselves. And so this white block will move up and down on this track throughout the game. And then when we reach the night or we reach the morale phase, then we'll have to either discard determination tokens or gain determination tokens. If we are called on to discard determination tokens and we don't have any, we will take a wound for each determination token that we're unable to discard. During the production phase, players will look at the uh, production abilities they have available on the island and see what they're earning. So in this case, starting the game, we would receive uh, fish, which would be a food, 
and wood from our island spot, and we place those in the available resources spot. That means they're available for us to use this turn. If they've been, uh, sometimes we're called on to place resources in the future resources spot. That means that we don't have them now. We'll have to wait until the next round, in which case they move down. Uh, but during the production phase, place, uh, resources are placed, resources from the island squares are placed into the available resources square. Phase four is the action phase. This is really the heart, the meat of the game. So as we discussed earlier, each character has two pawns, two action pawns that they've been provided. And because we're playing the solo game, we also have access to Friday and the dog, which means we'll have four action tokens to place throughout the board. And so depending on what actions we want to take, we will place either on the build, explore, or excuse me, this is explore, and the uh, produce, maybe deal with threat. Actually, if we place it on the card we want to resolve. Perhaps we want to hunt, if we want to hunt, we would take two tokens. Uh, we could uh, prepare the camp, or we could rest. So walking through each phase, you'll notice here there's uh, two icons. That means it would take two pawns to complete the, the hunting action. Uh, for the build and the uh, produce resources and explore, those have either a two or a one icon, which means either I can place two tokens, two pawns, in order to automatically complete that action, or I do have the option to place one pawn, but if I do that, I'm going to have to take the appropriately colored dice and roll them to see if I actually complete it. In this case, I did not. This comes up as a failure, although I do get two determination tokens. There's a two determination token icon showing there. This shows I also took a wound while doing it, and I'm not going to draw an adventure card uh, with this dice roll. Now we look at how to place our pawns. Let's look at actually how uh, to resolve those actions. So let's say that I did want to resolve the threat action. I placed a pawn on the card that I wanted to resolve. In this case, the starting uh, card, which is talking about uh, food crates and an expedition for food, if I place one pawn here, I can get one food. If I place two, according to the card, I can get two food immediately and then I can discard that card. Each threat will be resolved differently depending on the card in question. So it might, again, it might require one or two, uh, and then depending on, uh, just because you place it there, you might be called on to do something else, like maybe discard determination tokens or discard an item. Next to the threat is the hunting action. And as a hunting deck builds throughout the game, in order to eliminate the animals, that are, are gathered here and perhaps gain some uh, important resources, you can go hunting and it takes two, uh, two pawns to hunt. And so what we would do is we would draw a card, the top card from the deck at that time, and we would encounter that card. In this case, goats. So now when we're hunting our goats, we're going to look at the four columns they have listed here. So first they have the skull that indicates the strength of the, of the beast. For the goats it's showing as a four. And we'll look at in just a second the weapon track. And so we would compare the four of the goats to the weapon track. And whatever the difference is, that's how many wounds we would take. So currently we have a one on our weapon track. And the goats are showing a four. So we would take three wounds. Next, it also shows a, uh, how far we decrease the weapon. So how many of our weapons do we have to use to put down the goat? In all essence. And in this case, it shows one. Minus one. Well, we start at one. So we really haven't lost anything. You can't go below one on your weapon track. So that's a, that would be a push at that point. But then we gain three food. So although we took some wounds, we did get three food. And those three food would actually be placed into the future resources to be used in the next round. And also we would gain one fur. We add a fur again to the future resources. Occasionally the beast cards may have other effects to them, like affecting the palisades, or perhaps getting discovery tokens. Uh, the goats don't, uh, but we'll, we'll see that as we, we play through the game. Next to the hunting is the action, is the build action. And with the build action, it's one of the three actions where you place uh, one token and uh, actually place two to guarantee a, an actual success, or just place one and then you'd have to roll the dice and see if you actually got a success or not. And things you can do when you take the build action are all up here 
in this portion of the board. So you can uh, build a shelter, and when you build a shelter, you're going to flip your camp token. So we had camp token, and it's going to flip over to the shelter token. And once we build the shelter, it can't be taken away from us. And then we also have the build the roof option. So when we're going to build the roof, uh, we just would spend uh, resources up here. It will show you you can spend either two wood or one fur, either three wood or two fur, or four wood and three fur. Uh, it's an either or, it's not a combination. And it's not a combine at any point. And so when you just add a roof, you add a level of roof depending on, on what you're building. And same with the palisades. As you build a level of palisades, you move your marker down. And so what shelter does is shelter is going to protect you from the effects of the night phase. Uh, things like food spoiling and such. The roof will protect you from some of the weather effects. As will the palisades. And the palisades will also protect you from storm effects and uh, the beast attacks. Although the uh, beast attacks could possibly tear down your palisade depending on how strong the beast is. Next to that is the weapon track. With the weapon track, that is exactly that. It's weapons. How well stocked are we on weapons? How many guns do we have? How many knives do we have? How well are we able to defend ourselves? And so we can build up that track. That's pretty important, especially when you want to go hunting, because the higher the track, that number is going to get compared to the strength of the beast, and whatever the difference is, if we're on the, the losing side, we're going to have to take wounds to that effect. If it's higher than whatever the beast strength is, there's no effect of us, and we're successful in our hunt. Actually, we're successful anyway, but we don't have to take wounds. And then finally in the build phase are all the items. All these items here can be built as long as we meet the prerequisites. Some of them, the prerequisites are simply train types. Once a train type of a certain kind has been discovered, then boom, uh, you can build that, that item. In other cases, other prerequisites like perhaps brick or fire has to be discovered, or perhaps you have to pay wood or fur in order to build that. At the beginning of the game, uh, we have discovered a shovel because the island type that we discovered matches that for the prerequisite of the shovel. So we could build a shovel immediately. When we do build an item, we take that item and we place it into the future resources spot when it's, we decide to build it, and they'll become available to us to use later on in the game. And if you remember also, each character comes with their own specific unique item that can be built, and this is, will be built during the, the build phase of the game. Next to the build action is the gather resources action. And it's another one where I can place two pawns for immediate success, or one pawn, and then roll the dice to see if I can succeed. Okay, other resources, we discussed earlier during the produce resources, wherever my camp is located, uh, I can automatically get those resources every turn. But what gather resources does, is it lets me go and explore beyond the camp, so I can go to an adjacent uh, hex, so a hex that's adjacent to my camp, and I can place a pawn on that hex, and collect whatever resources, or excuse me, not whatever resources, one resource of my choice from that tile. So let's say uh, we had this tile was adjacent. And I decided to do the uh, gather resources. I could play here and I could take one food. Well, there's only one resource gathered on there, so that's probably a bad example. Uh, but had there been multiple ones, I'd only be able to take one of those. If there was food and wood, I could only take the wood, or I could only take the food. And so resource gathering is slow, and again, it can only be adjacent, on a tile adjacent, to your base camp. One additional note on that is that multiple players can place multiple tiles onto an adjacent island tile to gather resources. For example, if there's food and wood, only one player would be able to gather the food, and the other one would have to gather uh, wood. They cannot both gather wood, and they cannot both gather food. Well, how do I get a tile adjacent to my camp so I can go and get resources from it? I'm glad you asked. We've got to bring us to the exploration phase. And the exploration phase is again another one where I can place two down or one and roll the dice. But actually what you more likely will do, you'll place those over here to show that this is the hex that I'm exploring. And one of the neat things about exploring is that uh, I can actually explore up to two away from my camp, but if I were to do that, I would need an additional token for each space. So if I were to place one icon in the, or one pawn in this hex, I would have to roll, roll a dice. Two would be an automatic success. However, two and this hex, which is one, two away from my base camp, would still require me to roll the dice. Or I can do three, and that would guarantee me a success. And actually, that same thing can be done, I didn't mention it earlier, that can be done with the gathering resources action, too. Depending on how far away you are from the base camp, you would need an extra token 
in order to complete that action. Important to know though that only two spaces away from your camp is as far as you can go. I cannot explore over here at all. That is completely uh, denied to me. But when I explore, I simply draw a tile. Oh, I just take the top one off the deck, we'll reshuffle later. And I would place that tile wherever it was I explored. And now I have another source for food, another source for wood. I'd also get a discovery token and a mystery. As well as having revealed a, uh, it's like a plains or a brush kind of terrain. And once I do that too, I can come over and see that, oh look, the cure requires that terrain type. I've now met that requirement for the cure, and so later on I could uh, research and build the cure if I wanted to. Other actions you can take include arranging the camp. As many uh, token people as they want can uh, arrange the camp. And that gets you two determination tokens, and it also allows you to move the morale token up one on the morale track. And then below that is the rest action, and again, as many people as would like to can take the rest action. And that allows you to heal one wound uh, on your character. Phase 5 is the weather phase. Throughout the game, uh, depending on the scenario that you're playing, you're going to have to face uh, weather at some point. And so the harsh weather conditions will require you to roll certain dice, and this scenario will tell you which uh, dice to roll and when to roll them. Well, actually, you roll them during the weather phase. That's why we're talking about it. And so you roll the dice, and it will tell you that here I have two, two winter clouds and two, two rain clouds. Now, when dealing with, with snow, with the winter, that, you have to discard wood in order to heat. It's gotten cold. You have to discard wood in order to heat up your, your shelter. Uh, what the game has in play is what's called uh, unfulfilled demand. So any time that you can't meet the requirements of a, uh, a situation, you're going to take a wound for it. So in this case, if I had to discard two wood because of the winter clouds, and I only had one wood, I'd end up taking a wound because I didn't have enough wood to discard. After you do that, then you count up the number of clouds, total clouds visible. So here we have two winter clouds and two rain clouds. So that's four clouds total. You're going to take that and look at the total number of roof points that you have. So if you had four roof points, that would actually protect you from all four uh, levels of, of the cloud. Whereas if you only had a one, that would only protect you from one level of the cloud. You still have to face three levels of, of cloud. And so in order to deal with the clouds, you have to discard one wood and one food. Because uh, the food's gone bad and the wood's gone bad because it's been rained on. The other dice that you roll during this phase is the hungry animal die that represents random animal attacks that could come up and perhaps destroy your palisade or force you to discard food or maybe just make you fight a strength 3 beast. Also throughout the game we may have placed other tokens here into the weather spot. These act as just additional ones so uh, if we had rolled two clouds here we had another winter cloud over here that would actually count as a third winter cloud. And once those are used, they're only good for that one round, they don't stay throughout the game, so they go away until the rules called you to, or an event, or something called you to replace another one. Now, during the night phase, we resolve all of our, uh, we kind of bring the round to a close. And so at night, everybody needs to eat. So we have to discard one food for every player in order to eat. And that again comes out of the accumulated resources in the middle. This is a cooperative game, and so I, I don't, can't remember if I mentioned it earlier or not, but all resources that are collected are left here on the uh, pool in the pool for that everyone has access to them. Now after everybody's uh, eaten, they are paid their food to eat, uh, now we, we go to sleep and if we have a shelter built then that's great or fine. If we don't have a shelter built though, we're still just using the camp, just have a basic camp out, uh, then we're going to take a wound for sleeping in the cold night air. Uh, bugs are biting us, we're getting malaria, I don't know, the, don't sleep out in the open. Uh, also during the night uh, phase, and probably the most important part of the night phase, is that it's a time that you can move your camp. So if you have your camp uh, at, here in the, you know, the start tile still, and you've, got it, you've explored all the way out to say here, well then you're going to uh, probably want to move your camp so that you can keep exploring further. Because remember, you can only explore up to two spaces away from your camp. Uh, the fourth part of the night phase, that's probably the uh, most aggravating, uh, is we're on an island and we don't have a refrigerator. So any food that we caught and collected during the day that we don't eat uh, is it's gone bad. Now the trick to this though is don't don't think you can just collect one food because I'm gonna need it for the night phase because you do have the weather phase and depending on the clouds some of that food may go bad before you get a chance to eat it. So bear that in mind. Uh, but at the end of the night, uh, in the day during the night, all food has gone bad because it's been left out 
Uh, perhaps animals have, have come and raided it or it's just spoiled. Uh, that being said, though, things it's not all bad, though, because there are some non-perishable food items. Uh, there are also things like barrels or boxes that you can store food in for the next round. So you might want to explore uh, looking for those specific items. And then finally, if any markers have been used to indicate the character skill that was used, uh, go ahead and take those off now. That skill was only good for that one round, and so the next round a skill can be used again. Because I think only one, only one character skill uh, can be used per round by that character. So you take that marker off and it shows that the character is ready to use one of his skills again next turn. And then lastly for the night phase, uh, some items allow you to uh, heal or take other actions in the night phase that would happen now. So if you have like a bottle of wine, I think is what the instructions say. If you have the bottle of wine, you can drink it at night and heal your, heal your wound. And that's the basic gameplay of the game. Uh, some of the rules will vary slightly depending on the scenario. Uh, but now we know how to play. Uh, well, how do I win? Well, the, the way you win is you complete your scenario's objectives before the time runs out. And that's exactly how you lose. Uh, if you cannot complete your scenario's objectives before the time runs out, uh, if our castaway is the first scenario, there's 12 rounds, so you have 12 rounds to complete it, uh, then you lose. Another way you can lose, though, is uh, we're playing the solo variant, so if we die, we lose. But if you're playing a multiplayer game, if one person dies, game's over. Everybody's lost. You win as a team or you lose as a team. That's the way it plays. And that wraps up our rules video for Robinson Caruso, Adventures on the Cursed Island by Z-Man Games. The girls are already in bed, so I'll go ahead and wrap things up for us here. As always, you can uh, like us on Facebook at uh, Facebook slash Interstorm Games. You can follow us on Twitter at, at Interstorm Games. Uh, we have a website, InnerStormGames.com. And check out Z-Man Games, uh, their website for other great games besides Robinson Crusoe. And if you really like what you're seeing and you want to see more of uh, what's going on, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. It's the best way to keep updated on when we have uh, future releases. I do hope to get some of my own games out here. But in the meantime, I'm enjoying sharing some of the games I like to play. Right now, they're solo games. I've got some uh, stuff in the works with some local game stores. We might be able to incorporate other players. And as always, I'm trying my best to get you guys involved in uh, as many ways as possible. I'd like to be able to get like a large game, a large online game of some kind going on at some point. But until then, I appreciate everyone who's uh, hung out with us. I know I try and usually get some uh, weekly updates out or weekly videos out. We haven't been able to do that lately because of uh, some renovation work we've had done in our house. Uh, we're back in our house now, though, so I'm hoping we can get back on track. And we'll get back on a regular schedule uh, with this Robinson Crusoe series. And stay tuned, because there's looks like there's some big stuff on the horizon for Interstorm Games. And Interstorm Games presents specifically. So stick with us and uh, tell your friends about us. And we'll see you next time. And thanks for watching. Bye.